Good evening, everybody. Good evening, this is bro. the. Oh, here, I better turn this thing on. <laughs> yeah, that would help, Brown. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 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 Let's begin. Let's uh, We have uh, H.A. Uh, Signeri over here uh, who will tell us all about it. Yay. Okay. Boy, James Welcome here. Thank you. And uh, he has brought a cheering section with him. Uh, and we will hear from our speaker, A.J. Signeri. And he is the secretary treasurer of the uh, Chicago Socialist Party, and he'll tell us all about it. And even the pink of conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Well, thank you, um, Charlie, for allowing me to do this again. I spoke to this group a year ago when I was at the Lincoln Lodge before. Yeah. I'm so glad I'm back with you guys talking about a different topic. And this one, as, as the title suggests, uh, Cultural Drill Through Society. And in the description, I do, I do say that you know we are in a time where we have elected officials who are not doing what Thank you. we elected them to do from the local, state, and federal level. We also have a very corrupt economic system as well that is pretty much exploiting workers for what they are doing, they're supposed to be doing and give, not giving them the correct minimum wage in the economic situation that we're supposed to be having right now. And we also have systems in place of the international stage that is not pretty much not being more on the humanistic side but creating conflict which is why we have conflicts in the Middle East, conflicts in Africa, conflicts in Latin America, Southeast Asia and elsewhere. So what am I suggesting, what am I proposing, what I am proposing is this cultural renewal not what Mao said. That's a different kind of, kind of cultural renewal. The cultural renewal I am suggesting is actually doing things that we do for ourselves, helping each other out in our communities. One of my favorite saying, well, not my favorite saying, but it's, it's in Evanston, they have these banners, it says like, my yard, my block, my community. That's the kind of slogan I like because we as humans have to take care of, our, of ourselves, we have to take care of our community. Elected officials are not going to do that. Wall Street is not going to be doing that. Elected officials overseas are not going to do that for us. We have to do that for ourselves. So how do we do that? We do that by doing things. It could be some, something simple as community gardens. Some might feel community gardens not mobilizing. It may not be, but in community gardens, you're actually providing food for your neighborhood if you live in the city of Chicago, or for your block if you live in suburban Cook County, or in any other suburban area in the, in the college counties. And you can also do things like open your own school. In the south side, there's the Washington Park Freedom School where they actually talk to a property owner, and for the exchange of rehab in the house, they're actually conducting schools by using the homeschool law that the state of Illinois provides in order to have students in there and graduate in order for them to go to college. And they're actually teaching them the math, science, reading, as well as history, critical thinking, and other things that our, stu our children are not pro getting provided in the public school system or the private school system and the charter school system. So those are simple things. And the other things could be that, you know, way back when people came together and talked about things, not public square, I'm talking public sphere, this idea that Jürgen Habermas suggested that we can come together like this and talk and create our own policies and carry those things out. You don't need elected officials to do those kinds of things. We can come together and talk about you know, what is wrong with our community? Like, there are problems with mass transit at the workers' level and people utilizing the trains. 
we can come together and talk about those things, how to work with the workers, how to talk to people in order to do those kinds of things. Yeah. Other models have been worker cooperatives. It's happened in Spain with a company called Mondragon where people have taken ownership of the business. It's happened here in Chicago. Some people might help, maybe help me out with the names here, but I think it was called Public Windows at one point. Now it's called New Era. When the workers striked, when it was Public Windows, the employees of Public Windows bought the business and now it's New Era. So now they have ownership of that business. That's another aspect to it of this cultural renewal through, through democracy. Those are the kinds of things I'm suggesting. So everything has to be driven by people power, not by profit power. Because at the end of the day, let's say, you know, there's total anarchy because the capitalist system did a horrible job and everything. It's not going to be money that we're going to be looking to. It's going to be people that we're going to be looking to. We're going to be looking at who is going to lead us into a new society. We have no social capital whatsoever. How many people have read the book um, Bowling, Bowling Around by Dr. Robert Putnam? Those are, I'm bringing everything up right alone. now. Yes. Bowling alone. Yes. Bowling alone. Yes. Spoke at my synagogue. He did. Yeah. <laughs> and so in the book, he probably talked about this idea that you know this idea that no one goes to bowling alleys anymore. No one goes to ch church socials anymore. This idea that there's no civic groups anymore because why people don't do stuff. There's no social capital, right? That is lost. And that's what we need to be more invested in, in social capital. People coming together and actually talking to each other, not talking past each other. So is getting people left in the office? That's an aspect. But that's not the answer. One of the answers, not the answer, one of the answers is, like I said, People coming together. It's what Occupy has provided for us a little bit. Having general assemblies. Right over there. Not trying to be reactionary about it, but coming together in a general assembly and talk things out. How we can move each other, how do we motivate each other, how do we become the drivers of our own society. Because the elected officials and Wall Street, not only being corrupt of their creating the very injustices that's ruining our society. We need to be people in order to create a better quality of life. We need to be that. Because if we provide that to the Elizabeth Warrens of the world, in my opinion, that ain't going to happen. It's going to be people in this room. It's going to be people somewhere else meeting down the street, cross town, south side, DuPage County, all the way down to Carbondale, Illinois. It's all of us together doing that. It's gonna be the it's gonna be those masses. So some of you might lend to, well, we have to elect people in order to get those things changes. Probably. But you know, when we don't have that system in place, then what do we have to look towards? Because it's not gonna be any elected officials if there's gonna be a blank slate in a new chapter in our society. Um, my other my other point would be this. Um, when it comes to on um, the socialist, as I mentioned, I am the secretary treasurer for the Chicago Socialist Party and Socialist Party USA. Um, this is the Eugene Debs um, style of socialism, um, more of the the radical socialism, radical in the sense that you know we are for the, for the workers, we are for pro environment so forth and so forth. And the very things that we talk about is the very things I am suggesting, that we have, we just have to come together. We have to come together and we just have to, you now we come together, but educate people. Because there's not enough, I don't feel there's not enough educating people the very things that are going on. 
if we just look at the socialism for a moment, now people not, do not know a lot about socialism. They know the myths about socialism, but no one reads about it because it's not in our schools. And those of you who go to college, you might get it, but no one reads Marx, no one reads Rosa Luxemburg, no one reads Antonio Gramsci, Mikhail Bakunin, no one reads those people. And yet these are the people that we need to be looking at as an approach. Because people are looking at capitalism and look how far that's gotten us. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, people say, oh, capitalism is great. But, you know, we can't even pay sweatshops properly <laughs> under capitalism. So, in order to break this barrier, in order to create a new chapter in our society, we have to emphasize the public sphere. We have to emphasize that talking to each other is going to be vitally important. And we also have to educate people on what we're going to be doing. Because once we educate each other, then future generations are going to learn on how to reinforce the very thing that we're trying to do and everything. I'm going to bring in the design. Are you making up for your my, la my last point would be, as it's listed here, you know, I do have listed like free schools, community gardens, creative spaces, and related activities. Again, I just want to emphasize that these are not the, the key points. These are some of the activities that can be done. And sometimes you may have to create your own entity Instead of like a park district, maybe create an actual park group that people actually take care of the park instead of a government entity taking care of the parks. Maybe you need an entity to actually look at libraries, have a free library. Because there are certain things that are free. Not a lot, but there are, certain, there are some things that are free. You can just grab that other setup. And when I talk about creative spaces, the creative spaces I'm talking about are places like here in Chicago called Multiculti, where a lot of people can come and collaborate with each other and how to use our resources and how to put them together. Because there's a lot of resources in this room. And if we realize what kind of resources we have together, then I'm sure that we can move forward and advance certain issues here in the city of Chicago, in Cook County, and if not in the state of Illinois. And uh, those are my pretty much my points, so I'm just going to end it right there. It's not going to be a long speech like some of you guys are. <laughs> so um, we'll end it right there. All right. You're gonna. You better be up. You better be ready to take questions. Okay. Who has a question? Bob. Okay. You've outlined a rather what I call optimistic view of the world. How are you going to restructure society to get it to keep working? So what part of it is optimistic? Well, <laughs> it's often been said that a man gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning yes. not because he wants to, but because he has to provide for his family and he has to have a job. What, and you know, you have your a marketplace that runs pretty efficiently with the use of the dollar and right. the, our payment system and everything else. Yes. I've never heard socialists really address, though, the problem of commerce. If a company's owned by an employee, mm -hmm. the employees, and all of a sudden they're doing something that's going to get them bankrupt because Joe Schmo down the street is competition, right. and they can't move quick enough, a socialist model says it's all going to basically, where's the innovation part of it? Where's the part that 
gets the new company started? Mm -hmm. Where's the part of it that, that allows other older companies to go out of business? Mm -hmm. Where's the part that you get incentives for people to, to get, to make, to take a risk to go into business? Right, right. So, and part of that, the innovation part of it is actually starting from, from the community. The community-based economy portion of that. Actually having business at that local level. Because right now, as you know, we have a capital system that's very top-down. And none of the money comes to Main Street whatsoever. So, in a social system, not even a social system, because a lot of, I'm, a, I'm not suggesting a pure social system. I'm just, this, all of my points I'm talking about is all of my research, not only radical philosophy, but things that I have observed over time, and have done some practical work, such as open a bar cooperative, a tavern cooperative in city of Milwaukee, where we paid our employees 15 hour back in 2011, way before minimum wage 5 for 15 came on the play, okay? So the innovation part of it, you cannot have that innovation in there, but in order to innovation, Having an employee, in my view, an employee-ran business can be innovated because the employees right now are not motivated to create innovation. The last corporation I knew that did that was 3M. <laughs> the sticky notes that we all know and love, mm -hmm. they allow their, they allow an employee one day or a week or something like that to come I up with something. Right oh, right. And an employee from 3M came up with a sticky note. That not came, that didn't came from a board. It didn't come from research and development. It came from an employee. You were the usual? So this is one example. So that's what, when you have a, a workers' cooperative, you're allowing and motivating and empowering your employees to do that kind of work. So what's one other point? I'll come back to it. Okay. <laughs> I, I did have. All right. Let's... Is there a follow-up with that? Because um, it looks like you did. I got plenty to do because the, <laughs> the structures you're talking about are from what the more successful companies are they they do exactly that you know Google has their 10% policy it, you know you look at some of the new innovation hubs that are involved with sharing office space for new startups to come in right. certain government programs that will allow capital to come in I'm not saying that the whole pure capitalist system is a is a good thing because we all know that if wealth gets concentrated, it does lead to monopoly, it does lead to thing. But we have such things as the antitrust laws, you know, and 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 whatnot. But I just want you to: how is socialism going to do that, or are we basically talking about the same thing? Well, again, just to emphasize, <coughs> even though yes, I am representing the Chicago Socialist Party. What all of my points is not purely all on the socialist approach, because most of it, because some of it also is part of anarchism as well, which also works to a point. So, yeah. I'm just gonna... <laughs> any other any other question? Right. Oh, yes. Yes. Right here. And then yes. You say uh, uh, the, our capitalist system don't work. But the trouble is, we haven't had a true capitalist system in over a hundred years. True. So how can you say a system that don't work when we don't, when we haven't had that system for such a long time? Because when you have, I'm, and I'm going back to Reaganomics, because as you know, I'm only 32, right? I don't go all the way that, that back. But like during the time of Reagan, using that vehicle called capitalism, this approach called trickle-down economics, which we still use to this day, is the only model that we have in this capitalist system that we have that is pretty much providing the injustices right now. But let's keep in mind, there is no such thing as true capitalism, true socialism, true communism, because nothing, these days are nothing true. China is not a true communist country. North Korea is not a true communist country. China is a hybrid of capitalism and communism. The entire world, of, world is becoming that, uh, that hybrid. We're not, we're, the, we're that hybrid too. We have so much socialism in this country right now. Not, not 
as much than but, we should. But, mo but the whole world is, go is going that way. The whole world. The whole world, well, except the U.S. <laughs> Well, actually, there's, actually, there's a gentleman in the back. Dan? Yeah. <coughs> uh, oh! The gentleman back, not talking to you. Oh, no, yeah, an, an, example, an example of what can be done and is being done to some degree are um, available plots of land are being used for community gardens mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, <coughs> excess uh, uh, products yeah, are, can then be sold and are being sold in uh, neighborhood uh, farmers markets, you know, so that uh, you know your um, your efforts uh, in uh, cultivating the the, uh, uh, the community garden, you know, uh, the, the the product which participants, you know, uh, cannot use the access products, you know, are then sold, uh, you know, in the uh, in farmers market, and this way it brings uh, some. Circulating capital, you know, back into that enterprise, you know, and uh, the space, you know, can is frequently available, you know, by uh, you know, landowners that, uh, you know, they have to pay taxes on it, but they also have to, you know, give it some degree of, uh, you know, should we say, a respectable uh, 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 visibility, right. you know. So it's in their interest, you know, not just to leave it uh, as a junkyard, you know, but, uh, you know, I don't mean that it, it, uh, directly as a junkyard, but uh, not leaving the land, you know, where uh, people just dump stuff on it, you know. It's then being used and uh, okay. it becomes a, no longer becomes an eyesore to the community, but it becomes a, uh, a benefit to the community, and there are multiple places. I mean, there's one across the street okay. from, uh, you know, Ayala's uh, studio on Chicago Avenue, you know, Chicago and California. Okay. We'd like to get to what your question is because we do have a rebuttal yes. period. Uh, we, we want to come to the question mark. Yes. Please, we know. And, and, and I, well, the, 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 I guess question. The, the question is, you know, I mean, you know, at, at what point, you know, does one uh, seek uh, resources, you know, in order to implement, you know, um, efforts of this nature. So to, I just want to clarify your question. You're asking what, when, or how to get the resources in order to move forward. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. Okay. As I said, during this, what I call public sphere, and it happens all in public sphere has happened all the time. That is when, and we should always do it every day, to collect the knowledge from other people, those resources, a little bit of financial, the knowledge base, whatever the case may be. We need to do that every day whenever we are taking on an issue. We should be doing that every day. With the things that I do with my activism and the things I organize for, I have my own list of people I turn to. So, for example, if so, in the city of Springfield, we had a homeless issue down there. We were trying to do a campaign on how to fight homelessness downtown Springfield. I can say, okay, I need to call my friend Chris. Blankenhorn to do some PR work, my friend Anthony who does policy, my friend, my other friend Chris who knows certain people on one side of town. These are things that we need to do. So that needs to happen every day. Because if we don't do that, then who else are we going to turn to? Right here. Okay. Damn. I didn't hear your speech at the beginning there. You want me to start over? I didn't hear your speech at the ah. beginning. Oh, you want me to start over? No. <laughs> but, um, did you talk about Social Security at all? No. Um, so pretty much my the summation of what I was talking about, in order to have a whole new renewal, a whole new paradigm cultural shift, if you will, we can't rely on like the officials. 
we can't rely on government entities, we can't rely on the economic systems that we have right now. It's driven by people. It's driven by actual people trying to create more of a social capital because it's going to be people driven at the end of the day, not profit driven. So, your hand up? Right here. James Lockwood. Yes. You have a practical means of getting from point A to point B. You have a practical yeah, means yeah. of bringing about these changes that we envision in society. Well, what, one of those happened was what's called Occupy. Yeah. That's one practical. So, I mean, if you actually. I give. Well, I mean, Occupy is nebulous, but I, if you take the Occupy model. You can actually structure that in order to do the things Occupy can carry out in this way. It could be simple as, you know, I'm a, one of my firm beliefs is know thy enemy. Okay? And any of us can start our own organization. Any of us can bring people together and fight whatever issue we want to take on. So when we had people in... The city of Springfield, Illinois, wanted to get rid of every homeless person from downtown Springfield because they were a disturbance. They want to beautify Springfield. So all of us came together, no government grant, no city of Springfield told us what to do. We all came together, we got the homeless together, you know, created homeless change, unity for change. That's, that's how we did it. I mean, and we all fundraise for it. We all try to get raised money so certain organizers can get paid and everything. And we did that ourselves. I mean, that, I mean, that's a practical. I mean, that's one thing I can lend to you as far as a, from a practical sense. If that would help. Charlie. He's asked. Yes. Oh, I'm waiting for you to recognize me. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't think Dan is satisfied with the answer. No. Did, did you get oh, yeah, wait, no, we, Illinois, no, we, no, 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 we weren't getting rid of the homeless. The city of Springfield wasn't trying to get the home. Get no, the so homeless. did you give them homes? We tried to find them homes, yeah. but more importantly, we were trying to fight against the policy that the city legislation was going to pass, which was actually banning homelessness in the downtown Springfield. But so you didn't change the situation at all. You we changed the situation you by... Changed the structure. We changed the situation by the homeless can be down there and they can still do what they need to do in order to get the money okay. and all that so they can have the shelters and all that. Because otherwise that they cannot be within this, from downtown Springfield from 100 miles. Okay, which is Illinois. Yeah. All right, uh, AJ, um, it's all fine and well to do things around the community, but we're in the process of nationalizing the healthcare industry of the United States mm -hmm. and so implementing socialized medicine, which is about 17% of the economy. Isn't that a little more overall achieving? Uh, I mean, what's your candid view of that? that that's quite a significant change. Uh, Sorry, I, I mean, then this little local <coughs> stuff. I mean, and you're disavowing politics and all that. Seems to have worked. So, even though I am talking about local stuff, yeah. again, and as you know, everything has <laughs> to start somewhere and it has to be at the local level in order to make national change. So, in order to have true nationalized health care, not what we have now. In order to do that, then we need to create other things. Will it be free clinics? Um, hopefully, at some point, get that knowledge, getting people together in order to create either single-payer health care or maybe something better than single-payer health care and trying to do something at the local level in order to make it statewide, in order to make it national. Because there have been models in place where a huge amount of people <coughs> came together in order to make something national, but they always fall short at some point. Why not try it at the local level? And that local could be, again, your block, your city block, or it could be the city. 
or the county, wherever that case may be, it has to start somewhere. Because we started a workers' cooperative in city of Milwaukee, we then empowered other people to create even more cooperatives in the city of Milwaukee, even though there's cooperatives in the past. We show people that you can do this. So, um, so I hope that answers your question that in order to get things nationalized, like health care, like Social Security, um, they, they, I feel they cannot be done just at the national level. They have to start small and go big. This is just my view. Okay. Uh, Wes Swagger. How, uh, how would you now relate to what might be called the left brain movement and uh, also the short term electoral possibilities? <coughs> so, how would elections come into place? Is that what you're asking? How would elections be a part of this? Or how, would, how would you now relate? Left Green Network and also the possibilities of elections coming up. Well, given that the current system we have now, and some of you might know that there's a current um, Chicago socialist campaign going on that's taking on over the city right now. And because of that, what? I didn't know. Yeah, it's, it's been going on right now for three months now. I didn't read it in the Caribbean. <laughs> and so, so, given your question, Wes, the people will run for aldermen in 2015. And they're doing this in the wave of Kasama Saman's victory in the city of Seattle. But because of, if you want to try and create change with the system we have now, you can't just have one person, you have to have in my view, five or six in City Hall in order to have like a small little caucus in order to get the legislation we get passed, whether it be condemning TIFs, um, do something about police crime, or whatever the case may be. So in that regard, um, you really have to mobilize and organize people together and get on the issues that you really want to talk about, and then get into the appropriate election, that be a city hall, or the local schools council, or Sorry, honey. maybe Cook County Board of Commissioners. Um, that's the way I, I would view it as that. Does that answer? Does that answer? Excuse me? Yes, my dear. Yeah, I heard you right. Everything sectioned off that way, of course not. And uh, try to get along with each other. That might work if it's all over the world like that. But what happens if we get attacked by another country? I'm changing. They don't like that. Well, no problem. As someone did say once, this is a global village. You know? And. Yes, we do have com there is international conflicts, and we have international conflicts for a reason. However, um, there's nothing to be said that you cannot extend your hand to another country of like-minded people and trying to help get organization going over there. I have friends in the Netherlands that you know, if I I might have talked about this idea to them before, and they are trying to implement some of this stuff. I talked to some of my friends in Italy and the United Kingdom here. and all this. So, I mean, you can extend your hand. So, I mean, I it's not what him over here. He's much the media over perceives here. that everyone hates us. They don't. They, there's some people who actually want to listen to us and per what? listen to what we have and everything because there are some of us in this country here, who want to help other countries but being, you know, barred from doing that because certain media corporations deem us as evil people. Any, anyone else? Uh, oh. uh, yes. uh, now you're shutting me off. No, no, I was just... <laughs> I was just getting the, the speaker moved to a little bit better location because there was a little problem with hearing over here and not over here, so I was just adjusting the acoustics. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, you have a question. Yes, that is. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> what have I done for you lately? That's a political question. Then um, you, you haven't been paying attention, has <laughs> you? Yeah. Serious question? Um, yes. Well, what are you guys doing uh, in the uh, Socialist Party? Oh. <laughs> so, at the, so at the local level, right now we're working on the Chicago Socialist Campaign. Where it's not only us, but um, social alternative, um, international social organization, um, Democrats, Socialists of America, Michael, and you got them all together. I know, right? Um, <laughs> and a few other lefty, left people as well. And we've been having, we have had two mass meetings so far, but we've had a lot of working groups as well. And we're actually getting one person. As a candidate in the 49th ward right now against Joe Moore. Oh, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> there you go. Over this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, since we got time, uh, yeah, I was thinking about this. We were talking about the Olympics. Yes. In socialist countries, don't they come and take your child? If they think she's going to do good at a sport and you'll never see her again? What, Charlie? What are you talking about? <laughs> Ask the question again. You're very attractive. Okay, the, the sound over here at this side of the room is not good. Is it better now? Oh, I'm for it. So I didn't quite hear your response to what uh, Patrick said, but what does the Socialist Party, are you like the Chicago Socialist Party? Or? Well, as it's right now, I am the Secretary Treasurer of the Chicago Socialist Party. Okay, so what, what is your stand on, on this Obamacare? Um, it sucks. <laughs> That's a short answer, but I'm sure. Is there, is there anything else you want? Is there anything else I just cut you off? Um, well, yeah. I mean, what do you think about the fact that you know the people, the poorer people, are going to go out and medicate right. and have very the doctors are not reimbursed at the right. kind of rates that they're reimbursed on for Medicare and for regular health insurance. And there's a shortage of doctors, well, especially in Illinois, there's a shortage of doctors. So here's a, here's a long answer. <clears throat> the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare, is probably the most atrocious kind of health care policy that we have in the United States. The Affordable Health Care Act is more beholden to the insurance companies than anything else. The one nice thing is like a one little clause in there that okay, actually gives money if you want to start a healthcare cooperative, and Maine is doing that right now. What do you mean by healthcare cooperative? So it's actually you you buy into the clinic and everything. So when you buy into it, you actually get a low. Um, I do believe it's either a low copay or the fees you pay are, are low. It's one of the two. But that's like the only good thing about that for the health care act. But the overall part of that is we don't have the best health care system in the world. And because of this act, it's going to further us even down. Did you know post-Katrina, Cuba, of all places, actually asked <coughs> New Orleans if they can come up, their doctors, to come up and provide health care, and they turned them down. Cuba is in the top 10 in the world for the best health care. And, they, and, they're, and that's kind of a model between them and Sweden and Iceland are probably the only three models of health care we should actually be looking at. Because they actually are more about, more about patients. I do believe um, Iceland's and Sweden's FMLA is higher. <coughs> Actually, we're talking about this with my friend. In the United States, for your FMLA, you only get two weeks off for your pregnancy. If, if, you, um, if you're 
If someone has a child, then you get two weeks off. That's the United States. In France, six months. And they get paid. And they're guaranteed a job back. So, so again, to, so the short answer is the Affordable Health Care Act is probably an atrocious bill when it comes to health care. And how can we improve on that? Single payer health care will be one step to that, but there's other models internationally we ought to be looking at and actually having those conversations and not be like, oh, Cuba's bad. Why not listen to them and why they are in the top 10 in the world right up there with Sweden and Iceland and France? Does that answer your question? All right, I have a question. Oh, here, Charles. Yeah, I, I got an email during the week. Now, you were paying 15 bucks minimum wage in your co-op bar, AJ. Yeah. Now, the email I got said, Dad's cost of increasing minimum wage will be paid for by the middle class and isn't going to affect the 1% in any fashion at all. So it doesn't sound like a good idea to increase minimum wage. Is not to increase minimum wage? Well, if it's paid for by the middle class, it's going to decrease the middle class. I don't know how that's going to increase the middle class because if you raise the minimum wage at 15, then you as an individual will get 30, 35,000 a year. Okay? So I don't know what's going to be raised. I mean, it's going to raise certain business costs, it's going to raise other things. So there's going to be some distribution that's going to be moved up and everything. That's the case. But I really don't know how raising the minimum wage to 15 or even 21 an hour is going to raise the middle class whatsoever. Because if you lower it, how is that going to help the middle class? That's my question. I mean, besides, it's really the working class that's pretty much is benefiting from the minimum wage than anything else. Well, uh, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, and that is, uh, Marx uh, predicts, predicted a, a falling rate of profit. Right. And uh, uh, there are a lot of economists who say that's a bubble. And uh, you believe that overall, the general rate of profit is falling uh, in uh, capitalist society? Do I feel that the, prof the profit is actually falling? Is that what we're asking? Yes, the rate of profit. I feel, and I'm not an economist, <clears throat> I feel that what we have right now is not helping us whatsoever when it comes to economics. When you have money invested at the top and being filtered down to the bottom, it is more being a detriment to our society as a whole. Versus if you just start watering the bottom level and let it grow to the top, then you're actually profiting and everything. So if you're asking me, is our overall economic system going down a downward spiral? Yes, that's only because the very people who put the economic theory into place created built in obsolescence. Hmm. Yes, well, that's one factor in the market. Uh, it pays uh, to uh, produce... Uh, sure? Junk. <laughs> right. Uh, so that uh, there's a higher turnover. Of the junk. Well, but that's production for production's sake. Uh, so let's, let's, let's look at the housing crisis for a moment. Okay. From an economic standpoint, you know those um, swimming lanes they have, like they, they float on the water and everything. If you look at, if you put a weight in the middle of that, what will happen? The whole thing will sink down, right? Think of the housing crisis in that fashion. If you have a home or multiple homes that are filed for bankruptcy, then everything sinks to that bottom. But since there's more floats on that lane, 
supporting that house or the collection of, collection of houses, it's going to bring them up. So you have actually a V, if you will, where the more the outlier parts of those homes are actually more property than the ones at the bottom. So what I'm saying is, even the very thing that we have with the housing crisis, that is built in obsolescence because we have actually developers who are not doing anything when it comes to housing. We have certain government entities at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, that be the housing authority, is not doing anything. They're not doing anything. Are they, are they in business at all? Yeah, they're in the business of putting us out of business. <laughs> yeah, all right, Charles. Yeah, uh, AJ, what if I, in my neighborhood, I was Neil, and you said, do something in your neighborhood. What if I started the Bridgeport Fracking Company? <laughs> um, <I'm listening. laughs> and it's going to provide jobs to my neighbors and right. so forth. Is that a good idea? Well, Charlie, if you're going to open a fracking business and you're a friend of the environment, I'm going to be close to that, number one. <clears throat> number two, um, yeah, if you want to go to the extreme, you can do that, right? But you, if you have a strong opposition, obviously, against that, then your business is not going to be happening, as we can tell with fracking and everything. I mean, I was seriously, you're talking about communities, but... In southern Illinois, it's divided the communities, and um, that's what I was thinking about. So, in that regard, yes, it has divided communities. But as as you know, with people in Carbondale, they're having people down there to work with those communities, both physical and those who are pro environment, to come together and actually talk about what's going on down there. So. Even though the fracking issue has divided Southern Illinois, the last two years, if not three, I have also seen people, I, the last time I was in Carbondale, I was at a town hall and the whole place got sold out in this auditorium because people want to know how they can get involved. Even though the community is divided, they still want to listen to the issue. They want to know how they can organize, whether it be with Frack Free Illinois, with Dr. Laura Chamberlain, or what else is going on down there in Carbondale. So there are people even down there who are actually organizing, even if it's like the neighborhood club against fracking, there's people down there doing that still. Assembly campaign in the 49th district? Or? No, I, I really I can't speak to that as much because that's just actually developing as we speak. Uh -huh. But when um, John gives me more information, I will let you know and he can speak here at college complexes. John who? Beecham. Uh, he, he would be a prospective candidate. He is, he is, he is a candidate. Ah, yes. Ellen. Well, I, I assume you believe that uh, on certain aspects of the economy, you should have a market-based system, and other aspects, we should have a socialistic system. In my opinion, get away from the market and either have a socialist system or a communal system is what I'm suggesting. So get away from the market because it's the market that's being more of a hindrance because the market is based solely on the speculation. Okay, and it's the speculation that's hurting us. What do you think of the stock market? Do you think there should be a stock market? No. No. Because why am I going to speculate if the corn is going to be good tomorrow or not? Why am I speculating that? Because that's what we're doing. We're speculating on pigs, we're speculating on cows, we're commodifying everything. We're, com we're commodifying people. And we had, had this conversation with some of our friends the other day about college athletes. Northwestern University, the students there, if it has, did not know about this, they want to unionize. Because college athletes, for those of you who may not know this, they are commodified. They get a scholarship to go play at University of Illinois, University of Virginia, Stanford, UCLA, wherever the case may be, and they're commodified. 
You go to a Nike store here in downtown Chicago, you're going to get a University of Michigan jersey with someone's name number on that. That's commodifying. And that player is not getting one dime from that. Because of why? Because of the market. That jersey is being made in Vietnam to someone who is getting 49 cents an hour. And this college athlete who is working from 6 in the morning to 10 at night is not getting one dime except for the scholarship money. And if he blows his knee out, then he's done. He's not getting a cent from Nike. That college athlete you talk about, yes. he is not an employee, though. Yeah, he is. He had, he paid, if he was an if he was truly an employee, yes. On that, the, the money he's get, he would have to pay taxes on that scholarship. I understand what you're saying, and so you're right. He's not an employee. But yes, he is an employee. Now I'm stepping out of AJ. <laughs> I'm stepping out as AJ activist to now AJ, former NCAA college coach and player right now. When I recruit you to play for me, I am asking you to work for me. I'm asking you to go to the tennis court at seven in the morning till 10 o'clock in the morning to work on drills I'm asking you to go to class. I'm asking you to come back at 6 p.m. so you can do strength and conditioning. And I'm asking you to go to bed at 10 p.m. because we're flying out to Penn State University the next day. And if you don't do that, then I'm going to cut your scholarship and give it to someone else. I may bench you. I am the boss. You're the employee. You're getting paid for what I tell you to do. I just don't think the idea of union would fit. They do. I do think they need some kind of a representation. I right. just don't know if the, the union umbrella is the right vehicle for this. I think the only union would be an IWW model for the college players to use because I think college athletes do need to have some sort of union or a union-like model because for those of you who do follow sports, if you recall, and I've used the example many times this past two weeks, when University of Michigan had what was called the Fab Five, some of you may know of Chris Weber, Jalen Rose, all of them played on this group called the Fab Five. That was the first time Nike put their names in the back of the University of Michigan jerseys. C. Weber, Jalen Rose, all that. They found out about that they did not wear that jersey the next day at practice because they felt they're not getting a dime from that because Nike is now getting a profit from their name now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, it, but isn't that just an issue more of copyright and, and, and uh, legality as far as name recognition and not a socialist issue? That, well, at this point we're not talking about socialist issues, we're actually talking about that. But yes, it is a copyright issue, it is about intellectual property. But the question was about... Are they employees or not? Yes. Is there, and, and, and do they own their image or not right. under the employee of the university? But isn't that more a matter of contractual law in the courts? Well, it depends on who, what court will be filed under. If it's actually sports entertainment law, civil law, that's where it's nebulous at this point. You think that you know, socialism would uh, change the laws so that workers would have more rights? Yes. Well, yes, yeah. yeah. I, I work at Gary. Okay. Oh, um, maybe you know oh, yes. from U.S. Steel. Yes. And they've gone to court to lower the property tax. And they won. Sure, so the mill one. What? The, the worker, the mill worker one. No, I mean the steel <laughs> corporation. Okay. Why didn't want to pay Gary so much property Okay. Tax. So they won in court. So the city of Gary stopped. Uh, right.
taking up something. Right now. I turn it from It's NSA monitoring our meeting. Oh, no. Just, just, just go ahead. It should, it should work now. To answer your question, uh, the one part you also missed, there's a, a company in, in Spain called Manuel yes, Congress yes. Workers no, Cooperative. Oh. It would be like that model. Yes, honey. Change back. No. Thanks. How to make the city richer? Yeah. If we're still using the market-based economies and the system we have now in order to make the citizens of Gary profitable, if you will. The, the company, if, a worker, if it was a worker's own community, has to talk to the city of Gary and how they can bridge that relationship together because two entities cannot work against each other. They have to work with each other. So how can, this, how can the employees that mill work with it? Because it happened in my town, Sterling. We had North Western Water and Water for years. As soon as they closed, they filed Chapter 7, about 40% of that sit of Sterling's income, city income, dropped. And now they are getting what? Walmart distribution plant, Super Walmart, Super Menards, big box stores. Because they want to put that Band-Aid in the community, which I'm assuming at this point Gary's doing the same thing. They're trying to find Band-Aids for the symptoms, and the systemic problem is the corporation. <laughs> Charles. Yeah, I've been watching C-SPAN listening to these Republicans, and I've heard this from some guys here at the college. The capitalism would be pretty good if it wasn't for these government coming in and regulating them. What would you think our life would be, look like if we had capitalism without regulation? Of any without kind? regulation? Yes. <laughs> If we had capitalism without regulation, I think capitalism will be a further systemic problem. More for-profit prisons, more for-profit education, more for-profit mass transit. <laughs> um, that's the that's gonna be the problem. How, how I look at it. Okay. Are there no prisons or there so, more houses? Um, yeah. <laughs> why don't we go? Sit down. Let's go to rebuttals uh, and give them some extra time. All right, we have time for rebuttals. All right, let's and send how them. How many here have some rebuttals? Socials, yeah. Yes, sir. <clears throat> no work, get everything for free. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, well, We'll, we'll make it five minutes, an arbitrary five Actually, minutes. let's go to seven. I can time it better at seven. Seven? We got, we got enough time. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. All right. Okay. okay. Starting with Tim Bolton. Yeah, no one, no one, no one has to work. You just go once a week and uh, get free uh, stuff. Behind the podium. Frankly, tonight, I know your heart is in the right place, but I think your views are sadly mistaken. <laughs> Here we go. Let me tell you why. Capitalism for the last 300 years has provided the goods to bring the world a better place. We all would still be on those collective work farms if we had socialism. Oh, we gotta do work for the good of the whole. Well, to me, to be honest with you, trade, money, the stock market, all the institutions that make modern life governable are embedded in capitalism. First of all, I think capitalism produces a, a somewhat modicum of happiness because it does give you a choice of where you want to work, how you want to spend your life, and you don't have to do what the government tells you to do unless you're in 
a socialistic kind of system or choose to go into that line of work with the government. Thank you very much. Two, it produces a lot of viable alternatives by other companies. If you don't like the place you're working at, at the wage you're working at, you don't have to be a victim. You can go to school. You could make a choice and leave the company. Uh, you can do many other things. Now, I know that there are people who are not able to work and not, will, you know, and not physically capable of doing things. And yes, we do need taxes. We do need some form of government assistance. We do need unemployment insurance. I'm not saying do away with government because it is a viable institution that keeps markets somewhat regulated. I mean, even even if you go to the most virulent capitalist anti-government person around, ask him if he wants to take away the federal courts, and he'll say, no way. All it takes is one contract dispute. The big benefit that capitalism provides is innovation for new companies. A guy goes out and he takes a risk, and that risk may or may not pay off. If it doesn't pay off, he can go bankrupt and start over. Many businessmen have done this. Many jobs have been created because of this. The next thing that we can do with capitalism is we have a vote under a democratic system and under a democratic social, you know, under a democratic thing. We have two types of votes. One, one person, one vote for the, our elected officials. And second, you vote every day with your dollar. You go to the restaurant that provides the best service. You go to the provider or hairdresser that you do. And you have freedom to spend your money where it's most going to be taken. You have freedom. You're not assigned a life like in other government programs. Now, one of the key reasons socialism doesn't work is because it is a monopolistic control by the state. And what he's actually talking about is in a lot of ways barter or what can be accomplished with something called Bitcoin. The one thing that I do believe capitalism does provide is that you can choose your life. And when you work at something, if you be your best, you will eventually be recognized. And, you know, it does codify with human nature in a, quite a bit because a lot of us are greedy SOBs. And we want to make money. But the only way we're really going to make money without taking advantage of others is to go to work and be our best. I don't think that capitalism is a fraud. A fraud is a fraud, no matter what happens, and what the big banks did was simply write bad loans. They went, should have gone bankrupt, but I think at the same time, the bankruptcy was so big that it would have devastated our system, so maybe there was some methodology for socialism for the banks. But, I, you know, greed, Ivan Bosky, in a sense, it is good. Oh, I mean, yeah. in, in, in a sense, it can be, it, you know, when it drives you to produce a product or a service better than your next guy, and you're making a little money at it, remember, they're voting with their, your dollars to get your service. And so, if you're going to cheat them, you're eventually going to go out of business. You also have equality of opportunity, particularly in America. Still, you have privilege, you have this, maybe you're born into something else, but it's not the same type of caste system or other systems that you'd see, like you'd see in the old kingdoms that came in. The other thing is that the social good is done by a lot of people under capitalism. The social good that you do is a lot of times by the very work that you do. For example, you know, just running this college here for me is a, a labor of love. It's a, it's a voluntary endeavor. But, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it without the free services given by Google or the web hosting or the cheap cameras that were made by the Consumer Electronics Association, Can or the services given by this restaurant. Somewhere in here. And a lot of you do do right a lot of social good. You know, you work in charities, you work, do a volunteer work, you do other things. And yes, if you want the community garden, you can go out and join your local community garden thing, get your food co-op going. And the point of the matter is, is that your co-op can go in under that same worker's ownership, and if it becomes and makes money, it may be a viable model. That's exactly what the farmers did when they did with grain elevators a century ago. They brought in their crops into a grain elevator so that they would, would be able to stabilize all the prices that they made. Everybody comes at once, the price goes down. If they can dole it out little by little with a community grain elevator, that's why the commodities market was made. 
was to bring a little bit of price stability to the market. And as far as health concerns are concerned, I think the capitalistic system provides the goods there as well. Just take a look at the incredible food choice we have. We can go to Walmart and buy our groceries there, or we can go to a market like Whole Foods. We can go anywhere else and, and get it. And in our country in particular, we pay less on a percentage basis for food than a lot of other people as well. So my friends, you know, capitalism rules, socialism in its more truer forms doesn't deliver the goods. You need a market. The market is controlled by something called a pricing mechanism. It's tailored with human needs. And seeing as how we've gone around the world and seen development in the last 300 years, I think the verdict is in capitalism rules. Thank you very much. Entertaining. <laughs> People work under capitalism, people work under feudalism, people work under Pharaoh, and there were certain discontents with each of these systems, and each of these systems were a shift from uh, the previous. Uh, we can shift again. It doesn't, but we, you have to look to see what kind of shift you want to make in your social arrangements. Now, Karl Marx was interested in the social relations of production. You saw people being oppressed and uh, cheated, uh, and he uh, felt that, that there must be a way of doing things better. And uh, he was not alone in this. There were plenty of uh, Christian socialists, uh, there were uh, plenty of uh, Jewish socialists, there were plenty of uh, people who uh, resisted and uh, looked for alternatives to the kind of exploitation uh, that prevails uh, under private ownership of the means of production. And so, uh, but Marx what contributed something else. He said that uh, scientifically, uh, the, the uh, uh, contradictory tendency within the capitalist market and the capitalist uh, development would uh, lead to uh, a catastrophe. And people would have to organize for an alternative to like the, this uh, uh, coming catastrophe. He said that, that there were there were periods in, in which the, the capitalist economies dysfunctioned, simply fell apart. Uh, these were depressions, and uh, with just been experiencing one of these uh, depressions for the last few years with a lot of people and a lot of means of production uh, simply not being used and uh, laid off, put aside, and uh, the uh, needs uh, the goods and services uh, that uh, would uh, normally have, have come uh, have not. So uh, people are hurting. The Lincoln restaurant we were in uh, for several years had to shut. Why? Because 
many people, particularly people in that neighborhood, uh, couldn't afford to go uh, to the restaurant um, for a meal. And they went elsewhere. They went either to a cheaper restaurant or uh, they uh, uh, found a TV dinner or something else. Uh, let's hope they were not starving. Uh, the uh, Socialist uh, International song is arise you prisoners of starvation and uh, for many people who are living on the margin it's a feeling of being a prisoner of starvation you don't want to see uh, your family uh, looking uh, hungrily uh, at an empty refrigerator uh, you want them to uh, enjoy life and uh, grow and uh, well at any rate uh, uh, we were talking about enterprise uh, some enterprises are public enterprises Sir. and some are uh, well, private enterprises they can be uh, uh, Do you need change back? The, uh, they can be the corporations of the uh, workers in those corporations. Uh, that's a workers uh, uh, cooperative or, or uh, company. And, and it could be democratically run. Uh, to some extent, in Germany, for instance, uh, they have met Bestimmung, and uh, there's a plant in Tennessee right now being organized by the UAW, uh, where uh, the uh, the workers uh, have uh, requested uh, a uh, a vote, uh, and, and they're getting a vote, they'll have a choice uh, to either go with the UAW, uh, which is a capitalist union, by the way, uh, it's, but it's an industrial union. And uh, people do have votes in unions. Uh, they do have votes, and they do elect uh, their shop stewards and their uh, other officers can. Uh, uh, there may be uh, all sorts of problems uh, with the politics and, uh, of, of a union, uh, but uh, they're much more democratic than the uh, corporation itself. Okay, uh, when it comes to uh, having socialism for in banks and insurance companies, you know, that's the kind of socialism our capitalist government uh, uh, really likes, uh, and uh, it's the kind of socialism uh, they uh, promote. Uh, it's uh, otherwise known as state capitalism. Um, and that was what prevailed in the Soviet Union and also in Nazi Germany. Uh, different forms and uh, uh, the question of the kind of society that you may, now I, when it comes to uh, calling for an assembly uh, uh, to change uh, the, the uh, world, I, I'm not sure that the Occupy movement uh, is my image of how things can be done, but uh, uh, it's one way, and uh, uh, let's uh, look for others, co-ops, uh, credit unions, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, and unions. Okay. Yes, but but also. Uh, a democratic politics that 
are a whole lot more democratic than the Democratic Party. Next. And that's why, Brian. We have an open mic. Next, get, yeah. get up there. In Tennessee, they took, they voted that you need to. Who else is? Okay. Okay, and you're on, Dave. Good evening. Uh, if a tree lives in the forest and it's occupied by termites, eventually the tree will collapse and the termites will die also. And uh, that's very much the way it is with a socialist type system. They, they, uh, want to eat off of the uh, production of others and they do not wish to produce anything themselves <laughs> and uh, that doesn't really work. Uh, we need a, uh, a capitalist system which we don't have really right now. Uh, we have um, uh, a system that calls itself capitalist, but it's not really capitalist. We have an infrastructure in this country that is badly worn out and needs to be updated terribly. It is in dire need, and yet, we give tremendous amounts of entitlements to so many people. Not to mention that we give money all over the world in aid to many, many countries. I was brought up to believe that charity begins at home. And I think that before, I mean, I mean it's, it's nice to be generous and it's nice to be uh, kind-hearted and benevolent, but I mean, if you're a businessman and a, a person comes to you and he's, you can see he's broke and hungry and he, he asks for help, you might give him something, but you take care of yourself first because that's the law of nature of self-preservation. And uh, the thing is, it seems to me that before that we give to... to um, uh, entitlements to all kinds of people that we ought to take care of our infrastructure first. We've had we we've had a case where one bridge collapsed and a number of people were killed be, because of of the bridge. And uh, most of our bridges need to be replaced. So and that's just bridges, not to mention other things. No. Uh, the fact is that um, uh, if I buy into uh, to the argument that our speaker made tonight, then I'll say, okay, uh, I'm going to talk the rest of the, the uh, people in this restaurant into going along with this idea, and we'll start by none of us paying the bill. Uh, we're, we're, after all, we want to get away from markets. So we won't pay the bill. Of course, when we don't pay the bill, I can guarantee you this room will not be provided anymore. And uh, if enough people don't pay the bill, this restaurant won't be here anymore. So uh, the idea of a market system is the one that works the best. Capitalism never called itself a heaven on earth. Uh, well, unlike the, um, the communist or the socialist who said things like a worker's paradise, uh, only workers in a worker's state, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and all of these things, capitalists who are knowledgeable about political economy are the first ones to tell you 
that capitalism is the worst system on earth except for all the others. <laughs> and so it's a system that works in spite of all the hardships and things there are. Any of the others do not measure up to what capitalism is. It was uh, Winston Churchill who said the greatest uh, uh, detriment of capitalism is the unequal distribution of wealth. And the greatest blessing of communism is the equal distribution of misery. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. <laughs> Smoking gun. <laughs> misery. <laughs> Collective hmm? misery. Oh, thank you. You were good too. Okay. As usual, I'm the man in the middle. <laughs> Between him and his almost idolatrous worship of capitalism. <laughs> his fellow traveler, the, uh, the <coughs> libertarian Mr. Travis over there, <laughs> and on the other hand, the socialism that was much. talked about tonight. I agree with David to this extent Coke. that capitalism is bad except for everything else that has been tried is so much worse. And I asked our speaker tonight, who I thank him for do thank you for uh, playing the role of Daniel the Lion's Den. But when I asked about how he planned to get from point A to point B, all I got was a series of nebulous comments. And those of you who have seen the musical Fiddler on the Roof <laughs> will remember the scene in which Tavia talks with the left-wing student Perchuk. And in their when Perchik is talking about the new world he wants to bring about, and Tevye asks, essentially asks the same thing, how he plans to bring it about, and he has some nebulous responses, and, and, and when uh, Perchik makes these comments, Tevye says to him, very well, then if they would agree, then I would agree. And that's kind of how I feel about it. Um, from the, too many socialists, we get these responses that they don't come up with any practical solution as to how, how they're going to uh, get themselves into the saddle and change things. This argument's been going on uh, for over a hundred years, including when Norman Thomas ran in the 1930s for president and lost by a fairly decisive margin to Franklin Roosevelt, who it could be argued Did you take saved the capitalist system. No. Since if it had not been I for wasn't President finished. Roosevelt, I the talk. I came this back country would likely have had either a communist revolution or a fascist <sighs> one. And thanks to Franklin Roosevelt, this country had neither won. Um, uh, the best way I can describe it is this. I've told this joke before. If some of you have heard it before, please forgive me. There was a conference in Moscow many years ago, at which, yes, thank you, Brian, I'm sure you have, at which the speaker then paused for questions. And the speaker paused for questions. And the speaker, or the uh, one man stood up and said, Comrade Chairman, what is the difference between capitalism and communism? And the chairman said, that's a very good question, that's a very important question, I'm glad that you asked it. Under capitalism, man exploits man, and under communism, it's the other way around. And that kind of is, that's kind of is kind of how I, I realize that socialism and communism are not the same thing by any means. But still, that's kind of how I look at it. Finally, I noticed that there was some feedback coming out of that thing over there earlier. And 
That put me in mind, uh, to paraphrase a joke made by the late Sid Caesar, who died uh, last week, as you know. Um, and I was going to say, funny, it seemed kind of windy in here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Charlie, uh, you guys are putting me to sleep. Here's a grand <laughs> sleep. <laughs> you know. Charlie, you're always asleep. Yeah. Uh, it's not true. <laughs> uh, first of all, let's thank AJ for coming again. And be sure to join the Chicago Socialist here so we can implement some real change in our society. I'll be eclectic as usual here. First of all, Tim talks about, oh, it's so much better than being on a collective farm. What kind of farms do you think people were on, Tim? I have to inquire, before there were collective farms. They worked for the landlord. And collective farms was in fact an improvement. Yes. They it virtually was impossible to own land on the continent of Europe and in your Russia under the Tsar. You don't know about the kulaks? You don't know why they had a revolution. Because everything was wonderful, right? No, they were living almost like in the Stone Age. That's because And the didn't... capitalists didn't care. They were having their great parties. You can see that in Dr. Zhivago. The lifestyle of the aristocracy owned the land. And you tell me, well, you've got a choice here. You could continue to have nothing or you can be on a collective farm. Let me think about this for a while. Or, boy, I don't know. Which one do I want? Do I want to stay enslaved to some landlord for the rest of my life and all my offspring? Why do you think the boy dog just came to America so they could get land? They had seven sons my, and my grandfather. Do you think they had any possibility of getting land? And when they came to the United States, guess what the first thing they did that was available was land. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the history of the United States. Yep. The other thing is, you don't seem to know anything easier about farming here. You're saying, oh, the collectives. The collectives were established because the farmers were getting ripped off yep. under the capitalist system. Don't you know about the Grange? They're getting ripped off by the railroads. Mm -hmm. And then the guys here in the pit. And they weren't getting anything. They were toiling and not getting it. And then you tell me, this is an example you give. This is amazing enough. This is an example he gives of the success of capitalism. The, it's the most nefarious exploitation of people who came here to get away from it. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's the thing. Now, um, the other thing, getting back to the community thing, I, I wasn't started my professional life working for the Office of Economic Opportunity. So I know all about the community-based system. That was the basis for the war on poverty, was uh, community activism and community organizations here. Now the thing that you have to get in any discussion, and I haven't heard this yet, is that we sort of got on it a little bit there, like were you an employee or not? You were in a great quandary because under capitalism, there's only the, the guy who is in charge and those who aren't. So he couldn't understand that, comprehend it. There's only two categories, those who are controlled and those who are under control. And the very few are in control. Now that's where you get the relationship aspect. And even Karl Marx wrote, wrote about this. He said the fundamental thing with society, you have to look at what relationships you have or give structure to your society. Now if your relationships are all based on exchange, what you can gain from this person, what you can get, from, what is the most you can get out, what is the most, what, what work can you get from this person to make yourself to profit personally? This is the fundamental relationship in capitalism. The only relationship that counts is the one that is to benefit of me. No other relationship is worthwhile. Don't bother with it. 
Now, they, that's what I mean. They actually were looking at ethics. They said if you could construct a society in which relationships were to benefit each other, this then you would have good people behaving. People would behave. Not one based on this contest here. That's what I mean. You couldn't understand. It was incomprehensible to you that there was somebody in charge and somebody not in charge. Oh, it's got to be. There's got to be. You know. <laughs> that's what I mean. Anyhow, but that's the basic thing. You have to look at what is the relationship, is the fundamental unit that, that is the beginning part of the society, and how are those relationships structured. And there is the definitive thing about discussing any of this capitalism and socialism. Now, the other thing is, I've heard this old thing again, that somehow cooperative efforts cannot be, in fact, innovative, which I don't understand why. Things can be, I, I said, well, the Soviet Union, they were beating us to the moon, but they're like dullards or something. How could that they're be? Dullards. They're incapable. Well, I don't know what, is there no innovation? This, what do you mean? Why does a cooperative effort stifle creativity? And I don't know what variable there could be that would do that. As a matter of fact, you would foster it because acting independently, you're going to come up with nonsensical ideas or whatever. But cooperatively, your ideas would be of better quality. So far from it, there's not there's nothing inherent that says people can't get together and they do it all the time and they formulate ideas and agree upon a plan of action. It works all the time. It's just standard thing. So it's, it's the other thing. Now, last of all, I got to pick on my pal Dave. <laughs> and he's bemoaning the fact that we may use some of our charitable money to perhaps bring about the end of disease in third world countries or to alleviate hunger or something like that, when instead we should be building it, spending the money instead to fix up the bridges so that we could drive our Lexus over it. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you. Let's get our next speaker up there. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Li Ping Yuan. I just uh, like to uh, maybe I, my my def definition about capitalism and the socialism is uh, a little bit different, but just give you some of my thoughts. Uh, to me, uh, there are lots of discussion or talks about capitalism and socialism, but actually mixed with democracy and mixed with uh, totalitarianism. That's the opposite of uh, democracy. Uh, so today I just want to talk about capitalism and uh, socialism. To me, capitalism is based on money. Okay, not based on friendship, not based on power, not based on anything else, just pure money. It's simple and it's uh, relentless and uh, there's no no other friendship or something else around. Humanist. Humanist, yeah. But uh, socialism is uh, probably the opposite. Uh, you, you distribute the, the goods or wealth uh, based on maybe relationship without using money. So the father may, may give uh, things or to within a family, it's, a, it's a, almost a pure socialist uh, society <coughs> within a family. Or in a, a, a little bit larger, like a collective farm, it's a, everybody knows everybody and uh, they are all work together and uh, uh, good friends, uh, ho hopefully uh, they are all good friends and uh, then uh, people uh, work in a simple life. Uh, that's a, a nice uh, socialism society. So, but the, the, the problem with socialism is uh, it 
broke down ways get large. People didn't know each other, and the, some people would do something else nobody else knows, and the, then the only way to to <coughs> transfer the goods or favor or other things is money. And the money has been there in the history for a long, long, long time. So there, there's always a socialism, uh, so, uh, capitalism within our society. So, but uh, socialism, what I see is, it's good for a small community. Everybody knows each other, and uh, then they they don't they they just help each other. A person got sick, uh, although he didn't have money, and uh, everybody give him some help, and uh, then you feel very comfortable. But uh, in a larger society, of, of course, in this modern world, uh, you, you have goods shipped overseas around the world, and uh, then it's so big that then nobody knows uh, other people have, have a way around the world. So the money is, uh, 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 is necessary to be used, and uh, it's, uh, only the capitalism can handle that. So I think uh, those are, the, the, to me, the differentiation between capitalism and uh, socialism. Uh, socialism can be democratic, like uh, in North Euro Europe, Northern Europe, there are, we call socialism uh, democracy, and, uh, uh, and the capitalism Capitalism can be uh, central controlled if the rich people and the, the high officials uh, in the government are the same group of people, then uh, capitalism and uh, uh, totalism reason, uh, basically are the same. Uh, I see right now the China is it's transferred from socialism to uh, capitalism. They, they, everything is based on money, but however, the government uh, officials still holding the power, and uh, they are the richest people probably uh, in, in China. Uh, the money goes with the government people uh, in China in a big way. So uh, I try to try to think about things in that way. Uh, if uh, you think uh, I'm, I may be wrong or I missed something, please let me know. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, that's a question. First time up here in the new environment. Uh, I haven't really uh, formulated my thoughts completely, but um, uh, I just, um, you know, I, I, I was a socialist uh, back in my early days, and I, to some extent, still am. Um, of course, uh, we try not to use that word too much uh, in this uh, current um, uh, backsliding of our society, uh, because uh, I remember uh, back in the 70s, uh, uh, we all thought that... Uh, uh, the Soviet Union was becoming somewhat more capitalistic and we were becoming more socialistic and uh, I remember a prevailing attitude that the two were going to meet in the middle somehow and uh, uh, eventually the you know, Cold War was going to end and we survived that long. Um, there were those of us, some of us, that were in despair that there was going to be a nuclear war. Uh, so we are in this world where um, we have, we have survived that, although there's still some danger. Brad Little could tell you about that. Uh, he has a talk about that. Um, but um, we, we haven't come into this era where um, these labels and um, these um, uh, problems have uh, continued to exist in our society. And um, we, you know, from a moral, from a moral standpoint, um, what we should be thinking about is that uh, how can we get to a point where at least uh, the very large majority of people have a decent life and it's not too hard to, for them to have that. They don't have to struggle 
They don't have to work extremely hard. They don't have to work two jobs. Uh, because we have to hope that the majority of people are, um, as human beings, that they're somewhat decent. And um, we don't, we don't want to have this attitude of that, well, people have to be beaten with a lash or they have to be motivated, motivated uh, uh, by this, this harsh doctrine that uh, you have to get up early and then you have to work extremely hard. Um, at one point, uh, there was some hope, I think, that we would have a reduced work week. Gradually, we would approach what Europe was doing, where they were reducing the work week. We were spread the work around. Uh, there's still, there's been some talk of that lately, but it never went anywhere. Um, that was one of the socialist ideals, but um, it's fallen by the wayside. Uh, uh, Occupy really didn't get their act together enough to, they could have promoted that as one genuine thing because a lot of those people that were involved with that Occupy was, was briefly mentioned here. I always brought up a question about that. That would have been a very noble cause for them to concentrate on that the increased unemployment uh, could be reduced by reducing the work week and spreading the work around and giving more people this this dignity that comes with uh, from from the human nature that we have um, now uh, of, uh, uh, of of a job contributing to society in, in the most noble way. Um, but I, like many intellectuals, have gotten um, in despair of the fact that no progress has been made for twenty or thirty years um, in respect to getting toward that society where more people have a, a noble or a dignified life, or a life of not so much struggle. Um, and I really think that we are going to continue to go through a, um, uh, a bad period, especially because I, I think the chronic unemployment is not going to change as long as the capitalists don't even offer a plan as to how what they're going to do to take care of the chronic unemployed. So we're, we're going to, the only thing that could possibly help uh, save us would be um, a, a period of dislocation where there would be more unrest and more protests similar to Occupy because of people being unemployed and knowing, being at least certain that it isn't really their fault. They do have an education, they do have the motivation to get a job, even though a job isn't so great. And we, all, we all know that it's not true. The, the jobs in the society are kind of lousy. But the, a large enough segment of the population is unemployed. There's no sign that anyone's trying to help them from the capitalist end. There will be a dislocation. We hope it isn't going to be a complete revolution and a lot of people will die. Um, we hope it doesn't get as bad as the depression in the, in the 1930s. But um, when that happens, maybe there will be enough of a uh, tip, there will be a tipping point and um, some things will change. Um, the, um, the inevitability of the use of robots and automated technology, uh, so many things are automated. I mean, um, I, I work now as a computer operator, but I'm the last person in a department that had 12 people at one time, you know, not so long ago, maybe seven, eight years ago. You want some um, and the, the operation was outsourced um, to um, India. And um, uh, so many things are automated that uh, I'm, I'm the last Mohican, as it were, um, in that type of job in this, um, in this uh, country. Uh, but anyway, like I said, I, I, I don't have anything formulated didn't write down a speech or anything, but uh, I think that automation is definitely going to contribute to the increase in unemployment as a chronic thing. Uh, and um, when a tipping point of people who realize that they're unemployed, not because of their failure of themselves, but a failure of society, uh, we might finally get uh, at least some motivation to a change of um, at, at least uh, spreading the work around. <laughs> but um, um, it may take another generation to get to that point where we have what we were thinking of, in, those of us were thinking of in the 70s that we would have a guaranteed income or something of that nature. But we can always hope. Um, it may happen in my lifetime, but I, I, 
<laughs> Can I despair of that? Yeah. Time for round two. I gotta rebut Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, the reason why Europe and those countries didn't work under capitalism is because that system was never fully implemented like it was in the United States. Land ownership is the first thing you need to do to get a capitalistic system going on. You need some form of government registration for ownership. <coughs> in a book most recently titled Why, uh, The Mystery of Capital, Hernando de Soto in Peru st dealt with this very issue. And it was dealt with really well after World War II when we took over Japan. The first thing that we did with the Japanese people were to, who owned what in society? Was it a landlord? or was it the people that owned then actually worked on the farms? What they wound up doing was actually getting what was owned by whom and who worked what by whom and put a land title on it. Not just a thing, but something that said, hey, this guy's been a landlord, but he really doesn't own this stuff. It was a proper land title. And when you have clear title to a land, you can do things like get a mortgage. You can do things like uh, buy, you know, use that land and equipment to do other things, and that's what capital is: is the is the representation of an ownership for a property or a thing, and you can use that money to start a business or other items. A lot of times, it's on credit or perhaps the ownership of a company through stock. But that is what the whole fundamental part of capitalism is: is capital, not just the underlying things. A strange things happen though after you get land ownership. Like what happened in our United States. You get communities going together. You get those farmers cooperatives going against those corporations and saying, hey, you get markets developing. You get unions. You get change. You get things moving forward. The best example I can think of is after land reform was done was Singapore. It took them almost two generations, but they're now a wealthy country. And a lot of what needs to happen around the world is not less capitalism, but more, much more. Getting the poor to recognize those farms that they've been uh, own, having for years, give them clear title. Give them the means to buy and sell land. Give them the means to have access to the capital that they're already using. The reason why South America is still in the way it is is because of that landlord ownership system. Once the land reform goes in, and you can get clear title to your land, that's when the real incentives of capitalism kick in. Thank you. <laughs> Come on now, Tim. Hernando de Soto. <laughs> Didn't he and the Pizarros steal all that land from the Incas? And, That's um, the wrong Hernando de Soto. I'm talking about the one who works with the Institute for Liberty and Democracy in Peru right now. Oh, well, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> he just happens to be related by a few generations back to the original Hernando de Soto, I think, but... Uh, who did steal the land with the Pizarros from the Incas? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, his son undid the, his great, 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 great grandson undid the sins of the father. Okay, thank you. Um, I would also <coughs> like to point out, however, that cooperatives are not always an answer. One of the biggest and best known cooperatives for many years was the Hyde Park Co-op down in, down in Hyde Park. Well, that made a lot of bad des business decisions and it went under not long ago. And in its place, what you've got down there now is Treasure Island, which, as I recall, has a, a rather poor record with regard to uh, employee relations and to uh, labor practices. Finally, I did hear 
uh, Mr. Putnam speak on bowling alone uh, at my synagogue some years ago. And basically he pointed out that this is not a nation of joiners any longer. The people are now all busy doing what Tim's busy doing over there. They're all busy with a computer. And as a result, they're not busy joining, thank you Tim. <laughs> they're, not busy, they're not busy joining clubs. They're not going to churches, not just for religious reasons, that's simply because they've all become atheists or agnostics, <coughs> simply because nobody joins anything anymore. And as a result, virtually every church, every synagogue, and every non-religious uh, community or hobby group of any time is starving for members. Nobody joins the JCs, the Kiwanis. Uh, just out of curiosity, Susie, uh, Susie, just out of curiosity, after the after the Lincoln closed, where did the Lions start meeting after they left? Um, I, I, I believe they're here. Oh, really? They, uh, the Lions are here, the uh, Libertarians are here, the Democrats come here. We're going to have live banjo music here starting on Tuesday, every Tuesday. Oh. I got you guys and I got the Seekers, which is Bob, that, you know, you know. Yeah, we know who Bob. Yeah. Bob, Bob, Bob yeah, Lichtenberg. Lichtenberg. So I got everybody. The only people I didn't bring with and I didn't want to was the comedians. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> but I got them all. Thank God for you, you guys. Price? Well, like I said, I used to notice that plaque up there that said, Lions meet here at 12. Oh, yeah, the Lincoln. Well, yes, the, the number of Lions and Kiwanis is getting fewer and fewer. So, I don't have an answer to this. I don't know that Robert Putnam did either. But it'll be interesting to see how all this pans out. Well, Tim, I suspect my time is... You still away. got four minutes. So, as uh, John McLaughlin put it, bye-bye. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> bye-bye. Speaker gets the last word. Oh, wait a minute, wait okay, a minute. Charlie, okay, Charlie, okay, <laughs> Charlie. No, 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 you give me a rebuttal. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I was right. falling asleep. I didn't hear that much, but I got the correct one issue about this land thing, and I kind of brought this up myself. Uh, you seem to pivot this thing, and I don't know what this economist you have, that he seems to have fallen into this land crux, or I don't know, this land fixation, I think I'll call it. And it's the same thing that uh, Henry George, I've been... I'm, I'm not outspoken. It's it's good that people get together, and it's almost. But it's basic thing. If you don't know, is that it's it's land is central to all economic activity, and to stand correction, it's that's no longer the case. Right. And it hasn't been the case for about a century. Mm -hmm. Uh. You were talking about, and I don't understand even the economists. Anytime you're ready to, is it okay, young lady, if we have a college of complexes? All right, please. Thank you. All right. Um, getting back to this thing, I don't. I have no comprehension what this. The, the basis of all economic activity is a clear title to land. I said it started there. Uh, it has nothing in our economy. As a matter of fact, the thing that raised in my mind is, I've spent some time in rural areas, is that there are no family farms anymore. Yeah. There virtually wouldn't be any family farms were it not for the fact that our federal government has gone out of its way to preserve the few that remain. It's agribusiness, and we're talking about operations on a scale that are, are, are beyond anything. Mm -hmm. I, I highly recommend, there's some documentaries on the Science, the science of Food Channel, <laughs> on the food industry, at least mm -hmm. what things are done, and this are on a scale that is beyond any family. Mm -hmm. It's just, and if you, anyone who's spent any time at all going through places like California uh, to talk about a family operation is, is, is just not realistic. 
Um, but land is not regarded as the keystone of, of uh, well, um, amazingly enough, what little exposure I've had to the real estate industry, even ownership of, of, of buildings and, and so forth is not regarded as that significant anymore. Um, money is electronic, it's fluid. Mm -hmm. That's why corporations don't buy factories, they lease them. Mm -hmm. They don't want to tie up capital. Um, one thing I, even I was amazed, I was representing some architects, and some exposure to the retail industry, retailers, they don't even know what real estate they own. They don't even care, they've never seen it. Uh, you know, they, they're just passed around, these, these are things, pieces of paper and stuff like that, it, it accelerated. So, I mean, even solid real estate is, is not considered uh, anything. It, it's, a, it's a commodity. That's right. Things of this nature. So that, to say that I'm gonna focus everything on land is just whimsical. I mean, our economy is based on the productivity of the American economy. Right. Nothing else, how productive, we or people have a notion that we are. That's where the real wealth, wealth lies. Thank you. Okay. Well, just... <laughs> He's back. Yeah. He's back. Tell us about Jesus. I will... <laughs> Is Jesus a social? Um, that's a relatively good question, but uh, it's obvious that he was not living under capitalism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, there were parallel oppressions, however, and he was very much uh, opposed to the kind of oppressions that existed in in society, and uh, that's what got him killed. Uh, uh, when it comes to land ownership, yes, having the assurance of uh, uh, something of your own that the society would uh, acknowledge was uh, yours, and it was uh, productive of, of food or uh, or wool, uh, if you have sheep, uh, or uh, pigs, if you, uh, or cattle, uh, if you uh, yeah, were in husbandry, yeah, that could assure people uh, of a living and uh, the uh, moving, therefore, from the land tenure uh, system of feudalism uh, to uh, the uh, that of private ownership uh, did benefit a lot of uh, people, but they got thrown off their lands. Uh, not only the feudal lands, uh, but privately held lands uh, through it because of the enclosure system, uh, because a lot of the lands, uh, even uh, around villages, were uh, common lands, and they were enclosed, uh, and uh, people were thus deprived of the means of husbandry or farming. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, they were driven into the cities where they had to work uh, uh, and find uh, employment under uh, those with uh, the means uh, to put them to work. Uh, that was... So when people came to the United States, uh, Large emigrations uh, went uh, from uh, Northern Europe uh, and, and Central Europe and Eastern Europe to uh, places like uh, North and South Dakota. 
and, uh, the, and they were socialists, <laughs> and they uh, wanted not only to own their own land, but they socialized so the uh, grain elevators, uh, a, a socialist project of the Prairie Socialists uh, in uh, South Dakota, and uh, founded a state bank uh, so they could get crop loans and so on in North Dakota. <coughs> and uh, even in Wisconsin, uh, they had uh, a public insurance on uh, uh, cars. Uh, they've had that. Uh, I don't think uh, the, uh, the capitalist legislatures uh, are funding or or uh, promoting uh, those uh, to uh, as large an extent, an extent as they might, but they were liberating means uh, for uh, many uh, farmers and, and uh, the people in those states. Uh, I, I received the uh, Milwaukee Socialist Vanguard's publication uh, uh, the, from the Milwaukee Socialists. Uh, the Milwaukee Socialists, I, when I was National Secretary of the SP, uh, I, you should uh, realize that I am not totally impartial in this discussion. Uh, uh, I, I worked with Frank Zeidler, the uh, former mayor of uh, Milwaukee, who was mayor for about 12 years. Uh, and there had been socialist mayors of uh, Milwaukee for about 40 years. Uh, all together, uh, ending in uh, 1960. But uh, the, uh, the, they did so many things in the administration of Milwaukee that uh, uh, it would be interesting to see uh, how modern socialists uh, compared with them. Okay. All right. Speaker gets the last word. So with the theme that we've been talking about during the rebuttal time, all I gotta say for that part of it, if capitalism has done so well, then Ask the black community how capitalism has done well for them. How well capitalism has done very well for Native Americans. How well it's done for the Asian community, for women, for college athletes, for artists. And every single one of them is going to say, not so well. If, if it promotes capitalism, then you're somewhat supporting slavery, in my view. Because if you want the greed, if you want to do all that stuff, then you need <laughs> slave labor, in my view. So I've always seen capitalism as a systemic problem, the very thing was going on. So, but to be fair in this entire evening, my presentation has not been about economics. It's just shifted that way. My presentation is solely about changing the cultural paradigm here in the United States. And to change the cultural paradigm and shift in that way, that yes, we have to be talking to each other. Yes, we have to come together in a cooperative manner. Yes, we have to not be reactionary to certain things. We have to listen to each other we have to come up with creative things and not label things as socialist, capitalist, anarchist, whatever the case may be. Because in this room, not every single one of us has labels on our body. Even though on your program says AJ Signeri, 
secretary treasurer for the Chicago Socialists, that may be a, a part of an identity of me, but that does not represent the whole me. So in other words, my presentation of a cultural renewal through a democracy, dropping labels, talking to, to each other as human beings, working together, and be creative on how to get rid of certain injustices that are going on, and when we do that, we will create a better quality of life, and that's all I have to say about that. Close this up, Ram. <laughs> All right. Unless uh, we have somebody who's burning uh, to say something, I, uh, to the rest Actually, of us. Can I, can I just say very quick? Yeah, well, very quick. So, yeah. No, very quick. I just, I just come from Soviet Union, you know. I come from former Soviet Union. I like Russia very much, and I like even Soviet Union. But I come from socialistic system, not even, no, nothing about capitalistic, socially. And it was like a little bit, they promised us communism, okay, they promise, okay, like every, every communist party, uh, no, uh, meeting communist party, they promised us communism, blah, blah, blah. So, people, why you think immigration start to, in Russia? Because they was, I like your presentation very good because last uh, word what you said, people need to talk to each other, people need to find a better way of life, okay? But trust me, I came from socialistic system, we came to capitalistic system because Russia will be never capitalist country which they try to be like America. Or another European country, Western, America is unique, America is unique in America the greatest, one of the greatest, you know why? Because here is capitalism, here is opportunity for people, I don't know if you live in Soviet Union or Russia even visited different, you need to stay in Russia at least for one year to live. Trust me, people tire from socialistic system. Even it was no slavery, okay? Everybody was very generous to each other, open houses, yeah, share vodka, you know, and share good food, blah, blah, blah. But capitalistic system, it's one of the best. Mm -hmm. because Why? A, a part, because like, because it's a matter of opportunity. Like Tim said, um, not because I try to repeat what Tim said, but here, you know, a different plan, a country with opportunity, you can promote yourself, you can be yourself here, whatever, you can work whatever you want, whatever you do, even you can say whatever you want. And people have to agree or disagree. In Russia it was, <laughs> before we immigrate here, like I said, I like Russia. But capitalistic system, much, much, much better. Viva capitalism, viva America. You still haven't said why. Because, I said why. Why? Because government not allowed nothing freedom in Russia. Nothing. Is that democracy or it's a capitalism? Thank you, William. No, it was terrible. Oh, well, I'd like to say something. It's not even democracy. I'd like to no. say that the things we say are not even change. One pool at a time. I'd like to say that. I would like to say that what was not talked about tonight was that when they, they want to mention greed alongside of capitalism. It's like capitalism equals greed. Greed equals capitalism. Uh, but I want to say that what wasn't talked about is things like uh, charity, voluntary contributions, uh, uh, voluntary donations, right. uh, charitable work, right. uh, churches, synagogues, That's the right. Red Cross, the United Way, and none of these things are based on a, a greed or a for-profit thing. The, these are all things that exist within the capitalist Society. They're socialists. So, uh, Charlie, one fool at a time. They're is socialists. that okay with you, or should I I'll wait well, for you? Me you over. want me to wait for you, okay. or do you want to let me? Uh, I say. <laughs> Thank you. So, as I was saying, we have uh, uh, things like all through this country, 
uh, especially in the smaller towns, when someone falls on a misfortune, the people in the town would would voluntarily come in and help that family or that person. And, and that was all over this country. And even the national news media will tell you that, sure that Americans are the most generous people in the world. How can it be that in this horrible right, capitalist system that the people are the most charitable people, most generous people in the world. Oh, Obviously, so that's not the topic. Oh, are we starting again? I'll wait while you talk. That's not the topic. Whether or not the Americans uh, are charitable. I have my say. Am I entitled? No. <laughs> so as I was saying, that that um, those things weren't mentioned tonight. That's yes, because they it's would not the you, topic. Oh, we got to go again. Uh, <laughs> They would have you believe that capitalism is such a horrible thing. In Russia, it was supposed to be a socialist, communist system, only workers in a worker's paradise, and everybody was so much better off. Yes, the people treated each other like shit. The people had very little. They were all abundant with misery. And I want to mention something else. If all we had were a few Lexuses to drive over bridges, then we wouldn't need the bridges. But the fact is, the bridges got worn out by mass transits, railroads, regional trans railroad rate transportation, and thousands upon thousands of people driving to and from their places of employment. And eventually, any bridge or tunnel or whatever must wear out and be replaced. Charlie, I answer another question. Charlie, you know what else is very bad? Because we was not allowed to even travel to Poland, you understand, which is border of the Russia. Government must control everything. I can't travel yes, where I want if I don't have the money. No, people had money. People cannot even travel because government was crazy, socialist, communist. It was not good, Charlie. It was not good. Our meeting is adjourned. Yay. Yay. We'll see you all.